We're so excited to have you. I hope that this morning you open up your hearts and that you are blessed by what God has for us this morning. So I would encourage you to, to open up. Let's open up in prayer. Lord, we thank you for bringing us to church this morning. Thank you for waking us up. I pray that your spirit would be with us. I pray that you would lead us. And I pray that you would speak to us this morning. In Jesus' name I pray and everybody said, Amen. Amen. You guys ready to worship this morning? Great. Here we go. Let's put our hands together. Here we go. He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break. His broken hearts declare His praise. But who can stop the Lord? Oh, let's sing it out. Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain. For the sin of the world, His blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Him. Make way before the King of Kings The God who comes to save Is here to set the captives free Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is a lion The Lion of Judah He's roaring with power And fighting our battle morning and we sing it out. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? No one. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Sing it over the battle. Who can stop the Lord? This morning we're going to be doing a new song 
and it's called Jesus over everything. And I wanted to share a scripture with you. And it's from Psalm 119, verse 57 to 64. And it says, You are my portion, Lord. Another version says, You are my everything. I have promised to obey your words. I have sought your face with all my heart. Be gracious to me according to your promise. I have considered my ways and I have turned my steps towards your statutes. And this morning as we sing this song and as we declare that Jesus is our everything, I pray that if you walked in this morning with any burdens or anything that you're facing, anxiety, fear, that you would allow Jesus to become a source of hope, a source of courage, a source of strength for you this morning. Amen? Here we go. From glory to God's bliss to save the lost, grace and mercy displayed upon the cross. Our redemption, He's the hope for all mankind. One name over everything, one name over everything. Sing it out together. And Jesus over everything, He reigns forevermore. Our song for all eternity, Jesus Christ is Lord. Resurrected King in one moment, He brought death to its knees. All the power and all authority to one name over everything. To one name over everything. Here we go, and Jesus.
Come on, let's just sing that one more time together. Jesus over everything, He reigns forevermore. Our song for all eternity, Jesus Christ is Lord. Let's just one more time, church. And Jesus over everything, He reigns forevermore. Our song for all eternity, Jesus Christ is Lord. Praise the Spirit, free 
the King of Kings. Praise the Father. Lord Jesus, we magnify you this morning. Lord, we glorify you and we praise you. We extol your name. Lord, as we sang, apart from you, we are lost in darkness. Lord, without you, we are nothing. But Lord, with you, you have made us children of God. You have accomplished our salvation. You have forgiven us of all the record of debt that we owed, all the sin that counted against us. Lord Jesus, you took it upon yourself. And Lord, we know that you rose from the grave and that you are far exalted above all rule and authority. You alone bear the name that is above every name, the name of Lord. Lord, and you are reigning at the right hand of the Father. And so we just stand in awe of who you are. And it's, and it's because you're the king, because of what you've done. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Yes, give it up. That was so good. Yay. Hi. All right, you guys can be seated. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Jillian Chester, and I'm here to bring a little bit of news. I don't know if you guys can tell I'm still pregnant. <laughs> still. So I hope next time you see me, I'm not. <laughs> Got two weeks left, so. We'll see. We'll see how this goes. Maybe it'll be today. Who knows? Just pray for that. Okay, so here's my announcements for you guys. I got a couple things for you. First of all, um, if you are new, welcome. We're so glad that you guys are here. We are going to be continuing to meet here in the ministry center for probably another month. Our construction that we were working on at the ranch got delayed a little bit, so just um, check out our Instagram, our Facebook. Um, we'll always be posting updates there, so make sure you guys are following those. Um, our ministry, or sorry, our women's ministry just started back up. Um, it's not too late to sign up. It looks awesome. I was checking them out on Instagram. They had this like opening thing with like a fancy charcuterie board. If you like meats and cheese, sign up for women's ministry. Um, no, but really it's going to be a great time. So make sure you guys check that out. Also, um, <clears throat> we do have right now, we have children's ministry, nursery and children's ministry for this first service. So I don't know if any of you guys maybe have friends that come to second service because they have kids and they only think it's that service. We're doing it at both services right now, so make sure you guys spread the word. We want to make sure that everybody gets a chance to come, and maybe you're one of those people that likes to get things done right in the morning, get to church and get home by, before, like way before noon. You can do that. You can bring your kids to first service. So um, make sure your friends know as well that we're doing it for both services. Um, I do have an announcement about camp, but before I give that announcement, we're going to show a quick video. resounding yes why we do camp. You guys, I grew up going to camp as a teenager. I ended up working at camp. I was in youth ministry for uh, 15 years maybe. Camp is one of the best things that we do for the youth. 
like it said, God doesn't speak any differently in the mountains necessarily than at church, but there's something about it that clicks for these students and lives are changed and students are saved. Oh, I'm getting emotional. It's because I'm pregnant, okay? <laughs> but for real, it's so, so cool that we get to do this and we still get to do this uh, year after year. Um, so here's the information on camp. We're going back to Verdugo Pines camp and there's gonna be two separate weekends. We have middle school going February 25th through 27, and high school is gonna be March 11 through 13. The cost is $200, and I know some people are like, $200, that's a lot of money for a weekend. Again, is it worth every penny? Yes. Um, tell your kids to start saving now, or maybe you have a heart for this ministry. You don't have students anymore, you don't have students at all, but you love Jesus and you love kids. Feel free to support a student, we do offer that. Um, you can, I believe you can give online, yes. You can also talk to Pastor Justin or any of the staff. Give to the students. Send them to camp, you guys. I cannot, I cannot say that enough, <laughs> how amazing camp is. So um, pray about that. Think about it. And get excited if you hear a kid talking about camp. Are you going to camp? It's going to be so awesome. So, oh, I could just talk for hours about it, but we don't have the time. So I'm going to have Rod come up here and take the, the mic from me. But yes, camp. Yay. <laughs> Give it up for Jillian. Thank you, Jillian. Hey, how's everybody doing this morning? So we're going to be here for about a month. And uh, you know the story at the, at the ranch. We got rained out. And uh, the, the chief head guy is going to uh, redesign the trenches and make it waterproof. Has been sick for a couple weeks. So that's why we got delayed. We were hoping to be over there sooner. So we're going to be here for probably the rest of the month. Then we'll be moving back over to the ranch. But you know what? It's working out. It's working out, right? So anyway, great to see you here. Uh, a couple of things that I wanted to mention. One of the things we do is we do small groups. We're super excited about small groups, getting people connected, relationally, growing together, and so sitting in circles. So we asked a couple of people if they couldn't come and share about that. One of them is Monica Saunders, if you could welcome her. And she comes up, and uh, there's her family. Right there is her family. There's Parker and Woodson, and her youth pastor, Justin Saunders. And that looks like you. And on top of all that, she runs marathons. No, no joke, huh? Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, um, I just wanted to come and personally invite any moms out there to come to our group. Uh, we are meeting Tuesdays at 9.30 here, and there is free child care. And um, it's just a great time to come learn about how um, motherhood includes the gospel and how um, nothing goes wasted, those sleepless nights, picking up after your kids. Um, that's the gospel in that, and God sees you doing that. Um, and I know that a lot of us, myself included, have gotten very comfortable not being in groups for the last two years and maybe watching online or just coming and leaving and um, that's not what church is. Church is community and living together. And so um, I really encourage you to come out um, and check us out. I think it's, I think it's great. Um, and there's free childcare. So. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Monica. It's awesome. Also, one of the things that we do, we have uh, something for everybody. One of the things we do is for couples. And so we have a couples ministry that's led by Casey and Lindsay Phillips. Uh, and so it's love and respect. It's a, a renowned uh, video-driven series, six weeks. So I asked them if they could come up and share a little bit about that. Give it up for Casey and Lindsay Phillips. Good morning. Um, I'm Lindsay Phillips. This is Casey Phillips. Um, yes, we are doing the Love and Respect uh, Marriage uh, Study. It is a six-week course. Um, we meet here at the Ministry Center on Monday night, 6.30 to 8.30. Again, childcare is available, and if you like sweets and coffee, we're the group for you. Not meat and cheese, sweets and coffee. Um, and um, let's see, we offer um, all, all situations, all relationship situations. So even though it does say marriage group, if you're married, if you're engaged, if you're dating, if you want to come by yourself, your spouse won't come with you, come and join us. It's, a, it's a, a program that's dear to us because we've been through it, we use it, and it has made our, our marriage so much better. It's scripture-based. It's uh, um, led by Dr. Uh, Emerson Edricks, and he talks about God's plan for your marriage. So if you want to find out what God's plan is for you and your marriage, because there is one, in his great majesty, he's designed it that way, come find out about it. 
Guys, I know it can be a little nerve-wracking when the wife wants you to come, but I promise you we're not going to ask you to bear your soul or anything like that. Just come find out what God's plan is for your marriage. And we will be outside if you have any more questions. At, um, you can come to us and sign up, and we'll answer anything you want to know. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Casey. Thank you, Lindsay. It's awesome. So Monica also, she'll be up front here if you, any of the moms have questions for her. One other thing I wanted to mention is uh, we're encouraging people to read through the Bible. So we have these Bibles out as you exit. So if you don't have 20, uh, 20 spot, they cost around 19 something. But if you don't have, you can't afford it, hey, we'd love to give you one. We just want to put one in your hands. And uh, one of the things I encourage people to do is just start reading, develop the pattern. And if you miss a day or whatever, it's not like the end of the world, you just pick up uh, on the next day. So, and if you've never done it, it's a phenomenal thing to read through the Bible in one year, and those are available out back. Uh, I wanted to say one last thing before we jump into the message, and that is, uh, the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9, to honor the Lord with your wealth and the first fruits of all your crops. The word honor here literally is the, the original word which means weight, to show weight, to show significance. One of the ways that we show that God is significant in our lives and the weightiness of our relationship with him and the significance of that is we give back to him the first fruits, of course, in Agarian culture, was that they put God first in their giving. So be encouraged to that. I know a lot of people maybe haven't begun the journey. It can be scary to do that. Maybe it's never been modeled for you. But uh, you will be blessed as you give. So just be encouraged in that. So the title of the message this morning is to pray and to invest and to invite. This is concluding our four-week series on saying the yes to the best and no to the rest. And we've been talking about small groups and community and relationships. We've been talking about serving. We've been talking about the scripture of learning the scripture, living the scripture, uh, hearing the scripture. So this morning, what we're going to do is we're going to continue that. We're going to be reading from... Uh, Luke chapter 5, verse 27. So if you want to stand to your feet, we're going, if you are able, we're going to read that. Public reading of the scripture. I'm going to read the odd verses. I would ask you to read the even verses, verses 28 and 30. This is Luke chapter 5, verse 27 through verse 31. says this. Later, as Jesus left the town, he saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. Later, Levi held a banquet in his home with Jesus as the guest of honor. And many of Levi's fellow tax collectors and other guests also ate with them. Jesus answered them, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. You may be seated. And Father, thank you this morning that we are here. Thank you for your word. Father, I pray that you'd open the eyes of our understanding, that we might be able to see your truth and hearts that would run to it. Father, I pray that your words would speak to us, to confront us, to convict us, to stir our hearts, that we might live for you. And so, Father, we ask your blessing over your word, and everyone agreed by saying, Amen. And so this text here, I want to unpack it for you, but Jesus then encounters Levi, who we know as Matthew, and Matthew was a tax collector. And you wonder, like, what's a tax collector look like in that culture, where in that culture, it was like the most awful profession. It was very lucrative. It's a franchise. You could buy into it. Once you left it, you were done forever. You couldn't, like, become a fisherman again if you stopped fishing. So it's very lucrative. And so what happens here is Matthew is walking away from his career, never to be able to enter that career again. He's dropping everything here. And what says that Jesus looked at him means that Jesus fixated his eyes upon him. It just wasn't like this little casual glance, but he, he was gazing at Matthew there. So Matthew here, he's outwardly successful, has all the trinkets, all the toys, all the vacation homes, all the vacations, everything you could dream of. He is the most wealthy of all the followers of Christ here. But something was evidently missing in his life. Because after all, Jesus says, follow me. And immediately, he leaves everything, he drops everything, and he walks away from his lucrative career and follows Jesus. 
Now here's a guy that's been extorting money from people. Here's a guy that's been lying, been cheating. He's a professional con artist. He's dishonest to the core. He's an outcast. He's despised among the people. He really is. This, these people here, the tax collectors, they are the scum of humanity. They are the most hated of all people here. They're the lowest of the low. And it was absolutely unthinkable that a religious person like Jesus would engage a tax collector. But Jesus does, and he leaves everything here. And it says, it says, later, Levi held a banquet. In other words, he threw a party. He threw a, a, a huge bash here, and he invites the only people that he knows is tax collectors. And, uh, and so he's inviting the worst of the worst here, uh, people that are barred from church. You can't even go to church if you're a tax collector. You're forbidden from the temple. And so he invites all his buddies. And so all of his past colleagues, all the people he did meetings with and, you know, in our day, Zoom meetings and uh, go out to drink after work and all that, he invites all of these people they used to do lunch with and all. And he's thinking to himself this. I'm surmising a little bit, but he's thinking to himself this. I left all my tax buddies there and I, I, they don't know Jesus. What is their future going to look like? Now, I know the Messiah. And so he thinks to himself here, hey, they're still living in darkness and he can't get his mind off of this. He thinks, you know, they don't, what, what's going to happen to them with their eternity? So he says, I've always been good at throwing parties. I've got an amazing house. I'm going to throw a party, and I'm going to invite all my friends. And I'll, I'm hoping that spiritual conversations will happen, that I'm inviting essentially all the bad people, all the riffraff, all the thugs, all the hit men, all the thieves, all the criminals, all the outcasts, and they're going to personally meet and engage the Son of God. So evidently he talked to Jesus because Jesus showed up there. And so he has his guest list. Again, his friends, the thugs, the outcasts, the outlaws of the culture. And there they are with Jesus. And when they had a party in that day, it didn't mean that Jesus had a quick slam dunk dinner for 20 minutes. I mean, you reclined and you engaged and you had conversation. So that's what is happening here. But as I was thinking about this, I thought, what about us? What about, you know, making it personal for us? Like, who would be on your guest list? If you were to throw a party, Jesus could be there, and you want your, your friends that are disconnected from God, uh, that are far from God, to be able to engage the Messiah. Who, like, who would you invite, and who would, who would be on your list? So they have this huge bash. They're mixing it up with Jesus. Relationships are building. Conversation is happening. The original language, it was, it was significant. Conversation is happening. And then verse 30 says this, but then they showed up. That is the Pharisees and teachers of the religious law. Watch. They complained bitterly to Jesus' disciples. Like, why are you doing this? So they show up here, and they're like this. Jesus, you have gone too far. The religious elite, the self-righteous, rigid scribes, Pharisees there, they see this unconventional party and they come unglued. I mean, they can't tolerate, like the veins are popping out of their neck, tassels are flying, and that Jesus has gone too far. And they're thinking, this is outrageous. This is unthinkable. They're not allowed in the synagogue, and now you have them in the house here with Jesus. They're shocked. They're stunned. They can't think it. They can't imagine what's happening. Jesus, why are you associating with this crowd? So really the question is one of great outrage. Like, how could you do this? I'd just like to point out to us that this is what God is like. This is what God is like. All the outlaws, people can't go to church. They aren't allowed in church. The, the scum of the earth, and there is the Messiah engaging with the most unwanted people on the planet, the most corrupt, the most irreligious, the most messed up people, and there is Jesus engaging with them. And essentially, Jesus says to them, guys, you don't get it. You absolutely don't get it. All of your education, all of your doctrinal brilliance, all, you don't get it. So he says this, this is why I came. He says, it's not the healthy people 
that need a divine physician, it's those that are sick in their sin. And they just happen to be the most sick people that there are in terms of their sin here. They're the sickest of the sick. And I came for sinners. And that's why I'm here, and that's why we, we're doing this. So you can only imagine afterwards, after the party, what happened. What was the conversation, and we don't know, what was the conversation that Jesus would have had with Matthew after the party? What would Jesus have said to Matthew? And I imagine, and I don't know, but I imagine that Jesus would have been very pleased that Matthew did this. That Jesus would have said something like, Matthew, I love your heart for those that are lost. I love your heart for those that are far from God. You're a rookie spiritually. You're a rookie Christ follower. You made a plan. You, you were intentional. You reached out to them. And what I love here is that Math, I think you would acknowledge that Matthew was reaching out to his friends who were far from God. Uh, it's easy when you become a Christ follower that you lose relational connect, connection and kind of have redemptive rapport, which really, for, with, with, help, with people that have are facing a crisis eternity. And it's easy to withdraw, to become isolated and all that. But Matthew wasn't like that. He like kind of went against the grain. And he reaches out to his unchurched friends who are outlaws and outcasts, and he invites them to meet the Messiah. And I just want to say, friends, like, that's what God is like. And God loved that. And I think it would see Matthew right on. You crushed it, Matthew. I think he would love that Matthew cared for his old buddies here that no one else really cared about, the religious community doesn't care about. And he loved that he is loving people that are far from God. I think he would love the fact that Matthew was intentional that he was a risk taker, that he wasn't playing it safe here. He was reaching out to reach people, inviting his friends, inviting his disciple friends, and there's James, and there's John, and there's Jesus, and conversations are happening, and who knows what spiritual spark might get ignited by the conversations there. Matthew, I think he recognized this. He recognized that, like, the stakes are really high, and this, like, really matters, and I have to do something. And though I left that community and I'm not a part of that community professionally anymore, I can go back relationally and I can engage them and I can risk to be a light to my old friends here. And, and it speaks of this because really our mission is to do this very thing. Our mission is to inspire people to find Jesus and to follow Jesus. That's what we're really all about. And just like Matthew here, friends, he goes to his friends and his we, we all have friends, neighbors, buddies, uh, kids we know, students, uh, the an expansive relational circle where we could do something intentional and show that we care for people that are facing uh, a, a, a future without Christ. And one of the things we try to do here as a church is we try to be creative in our worship, creative in our messages, creative with our videos. Maybe it wasn't so creative, but we try. Uh, uh, we try to reach adults, young adults, youth, students, that they might experience the amazing grace of God like happened in this story here. We talk often about that we read the Bible, explain the Bible, and we apply it. So I want to talk about that. I want to talk about what this might look like. i got a story I'm going to tell you of one of my uh, times where I reached out to someone. But, uh, but I want to challenge everyone to, first of all, to pray specifically for people. But secondly, then, to uh, not just to pray, but to boldly reach out like Matthew did here. Who would you invite? I want to say there's people that you can invite, the obvious, like people that are closest to you, uh, that you can build a relationship with intentionally, uh, kids, grandkids, children, parents, family, friends. I think there's those in our lives that perhaps they've been, had an influence in your life. Maybe those are kind of, they've, they've pointed you in the, in the right way in life. Maybe it was a mentor. Maybe it was a coach. Maybe it was a, a, a grandparent. Maybe it was a teacher. But those that you could reach out to, that they've pointed you in the right direction. I think there's those that like you don't even, you don't even like. You have those people in your life that you don't even like. For some reason, they're a part of your world. And this is a group of people that Matthew invited. The world doesn't even like here. Maybe for others, 
It's those that uh, they're going through a painful season. Maybe they're more open because they are. Maybe they lost a job. Maybe they're sick. Maybe they lost a loved one. And I think there's those that have fallen short, that uh, perhaps they've had bad mistakes, bad moral failures, whatever. But there's that group of people too. So here's what I'm asking you to do. Don't panic, but here's what I'm asking you to do in 22. I'm asking you to identify five people this year that you could do what we're talking about this morning and invite them to some experience where they can encounter the presence of God through God's people. So again, pray specifically, but I'm saying five people. I asked our staff, and this was the average number that they came up with. One person had 25, but uh, five people uh, and pray for them this year, people that need God's grace and needs God's love and God's son really is for everyone. And so years ago, um, and you can say, well, that's easy for like staff to do. and We're normal people. Well, let me tell you a story before I was like a pastor. And so uh, I'm working, some of you know I'm bivocational and that I'm a dentist. So I'm working and, I'm, and I've got a kid in the chair. He's about 15 or 16. His name is Neil. His name is Neil. And I look at him and he was like, uh, just a complete cocaine mouth. And, I, and so I'm thinking to myself, oh, this kid, he's, he's like in serious trouble. And he says to me, he asked me this question before I gave him anesthesia. He asked me, he said, hey, I'm doctor. He said, uh, does Novocaine work if you're taking cocaine? I said, you're asking me, does Novocaine work if you're taking cocaine? I said, yeah, it does work, but why are you asking? I said, are you doing cocaine? He said, yeah, I'm doing cocaine. So I was getting ready to work on him, and I sat him up, and I grabbed my chair, and I got eyeball to eyeball. And I said, Neil, we need to talk. We need to talk. And so I closed the door, and I thought, I don't care what happens. I don't care who gets mad at me, but I'm going to go for it. I said, Neil, tell me about your friends, your drug buddies. He's saturated with drug buddies at Redlands High School. I said, Neil, you need to quit your school. When I said that, I thought, what did I just say? I, I, I know I'm going to get a call from the parents. <laughs> My kid went to the dentist, and you're telling him to quit school. It gets worse. And I said, Neil, and then I thought, I'm going to tell him what school I think he needs to go to. I said, I listed two schools that I thought he needed to, to go to. I said, you need to quit your drug buddies, you need to quit your school, and you need to go to one of these two schools. And he was just <laughs> listening. And I said, and Neil, you need to come to church. You need to come to church tomorrow night. He said, I'll come. I said, I'll be looking for you. The next night, Neil was there in church. He quit school, quit his drug buddies, went to the, one of the two schools in Highland that I told him about. And uh, his mother would tell me later, thanking me in tears. And she says, Neil was dealing drugs, and he owed, he owed his drug buddies so much money, they had him naked in a tub with knives, and they threatened to kill him. Thank you for talking to my son. Well, Neil, had, so he, would, he became the chaplain then of the school there. He became the chaplain, and he invited me to speak. And I would speak at the chapel at the school that he, he became the chaplain of. And it turned out that he was really smart. He was flunking out of school. But it turned out that Neil was really smart. And so he ends up going to Cal Berkeley, becomes pre-law, and crushes it, and ends up a top student at Cal Berkeley, and gets accepted at Harvard Law School. And I'll never forget the day that the, 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 uh, the secretary brought me some mail, and it said, Harvard Law School. I opened it up. It was an invitation to Neil's graduation for me to go to his graduation at Harvard Law School. And then he was such a smart guy, he goes to, and I would have lunch with him when he would come, come home and uh, meet with him and encourage him and disciple him. He started a Christian club at Harvard Law School, a Christian club. And uh, he graduated then, he went to UCLA and got his PhD. I mean, this is his story. And all that to say this, and I get it, friends, like, that's a dramatic story. I get that. But what I'm saying is that there comes a time when you have to just risk boldly like Matthew did and just got in front of his friends there. And so all of us, though, I think there's stories waiting to be told. And I say all of that to say this, is that there's the power of an invitation. 
Think about it in your own life, the power of an invitation. Invitations are powerful, and invitations, they can be life-changing. An invitation to me was life-changing when I was invited to Forest Home, never been to a camp. Now I'm at the camp, and I'm in this, this whole culture that I'm trying to get my mind around, but it, it impacted me so greatly that it's one of the reasons why I'm here today, because of Forest Home, and I'm so grateful for Forest Home. Uh, then I was invited to church by a church girl, and I really wasn't interested in church, but I'm interested in the church girl, so I go to church, and I've told that story, but that impacted my life so greatly. And then uh, when I was like 23 and 26, it was like maybe 10, 11 years ago, and, um, <laughs> and I was invited to Mexico, and then I went to Africa, and it really, it just, it changed my life and put me on a whole completely different trajectory of what could be, but the power of an invitation, friends, so I'm asking you, like, who would you invite this year? I'm challenging you, I'm challenging me over the next 12 months to do this year. And thinking about you, many people, the reason uh, you go somewhere, because somebody invited you, really. Uh, how many of you, you're here because somebody invited you? I think 80, 90% of us are here because of an invitation. And so I'm asking you to, to think about five guests this year and imagine, you know, what could God do if we would invite boldly? There's so many opportunities to invite, and I just want to take a minute to talk about that. So first of all, uh, I'm going to run through some, some opportunities that are here to invite people. There's women's groups. They meet Tuesday night, Wednesday morning. Bloom uh, is what uh, they call themselves now, the ministry. And so you can invite people to that. Morning, evening, opportunities there. There's Financial Peace University, which is one of the most stunning, if not the best, uh, financial course in America, and it starts February 18th here uh, in this room, Friday nights. Uh, Dave Ramsey is doing that. He's the genius behind the nine-week course here, New York Times bestseller. He's a financial guru, brilliant guy, national radio host, number, third, uh, number three most popular radio show in America. So, hey, we're bringing it here. And so everyone needs it. My wife and I have done it, Kirsten. It's a great opportunity to invite people when everybody needs to learn how to handle their, their resources better. We talked about love and respect with Casey and Lindsay that is starting. There's events like big inviter events that are like Easter and Christmas Eve and Mother's Day and Father's Day. And we leverage all of those so we can invite people. There's baptisms. There's baptism at Forest Home. Great inviter event there. There's Vacation Bible School. There's Harvest Festival. There's camps that we just showed you uh, the, to get kids here. Youth camps, winter camps, summer camps. We do work parties at the ranch uh, in a few weeks February 25th, we're having an all-church worship. It's really for all-community worship. It's going to rock. It's going to be right in here. There's young adult gatherings, youth gatherings. So all of these things we're trying to just make on-ramps and entry points so we can be welcoming uh, an unchurched community to inspire people to find and follow Jesus. And so, again, friends, think about this. What's the worst thing they can do? Like, what was, I thought, I thought about it when I'm asking Neil, thinking, what's the worst thing that can happen? I am going to get chewed out by his parents. That's the worst thing. I'm going to lose a patient. I'm going to get chewed out. Uh, that's the worst thing that can happen. But for most of us, the worst thing is, you say, well, no, thank you. Kind of polite. And so think about that. Luke chapter 14, I want to conclude uh, with this. And um, I'll be a little while to conclude, but I want to conclude with this. It's a parable, Luke chapter 14 and it says this, and it gives insight to the kind of people that are invited to the church of Jesus Christ. It says this, you can look up on the screens or in your Bibles. A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. That time the banquet he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. So the doors are being flung wide open to everyone here. God has prepared a feast, and you are invited. Everyone, it says, many guests are invited. So continuing, it says in verse 18, but they all alike began to make excuses. The verse said, hey, I just bought a field, and I've got to go and see it. it. Must be a really important field. Please excuse me. Another said, I bought five yoke of oxen. I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. 
Excuses keep getting lamer. So another said, I just got married, so I can't come. And I'm thinking, can you find your spine? Can you put on your big boy pants? And can you invite your wife? I mean, is it really that hard? But continuing, Jesus says, verse 21, the servant came back and reported this to his master. And then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly which speaks of the urgency into the streets and the alleys of the town, and bring in and watch. These are all that are invited, the poor and the crippled, the blind and the lame. In other words, bring everybody. Like, this is for everybody. And so it's not, in, it's not limited to, like, church folk. It is for everyone, including people that, like, you know, they've made mistakes here. Think life has happened to them, and the broken people, and the successful people. But it's okay to come. Uh, it's okay not to be okay, but it's not okay to stay that way. And so, but the broken people are welcome. And friends, really, like, this is who we are. We're the church that invites the community, the broader community, the imperfect people, the broken people to be a part of this community because that's who we are. That's who I am. And I just want to say this. For the rest of my life, this is what I want to do. For the rest of my life, I want to be a pastor that reaches out to broken people. And I want to reach out to people that say, hey, you know what? I'm not where I need to be, but by the grace of Jesus Christ, I'm going to, I'm going to take step forwards to pursue him. And I love that the church of Jesus Christ, it's a church for the broken and the forgotten and the marginalized. And it says here, the poor and the crippled and the lame, but they're all invited. They're all invited, so who would be on our list that we can invite? And then he continues in the story. Sir, the servant said, what you'd ordered has been done, but there's still room. And there's still room, friends. There's room for your five, and there's room for my five and more. There's still room. And I love this phrase here because it speaks of how we've been called to invite those who need Jesus. And there is still room. And no matter what they've done, no matter who they are, no matter what they put into their body, no matter what their history, there is still room for them. And I'm challenging you and I'm challenging myself to invest in people, to pray for them, but to invest warm, honest, authentic, genuine, real relationship. That's what they're looking for, to pray, to invest, and to invite. A study was done of Jesus and all of his interactions in the Gospels. There's 132 interactions that Jesus had in the Gospels. And how many of those interactions do you think were in church out of 132? There was 10. And 122 was out there in the mainstream, connecting with people far from God. That's what he was doing, you know, when he was doing uh, weddings and banquets and parties and boat rides and fishing trips and dinner parties and all of that. He's engaging the world, the people out there, 10 times out of 132, he's actually in the temple. And so what about us? The statistics are this, that four out of five people would come to church when they're invited if they know somebody that they could trust. In other words, people come to church, it's very simple, on the arm of a trusted friend. They trust you, they know you, they will come. So I'm encouraging you to invest in relationships. In John chapter 4, you know the story, perhaps, Jesus with a Samaritan woman. They didn't do life together so five times. She's been married. Jesus talks to her there, uh, and, and uh, she just can't make it happen. Like, life is not happening for her. Uh, her lovers can't make it happen. None of the guys can make it happen. But she's transformed by this encounter with Jesus Christ. He talks about the living water. Well, after encountering Jesus, she leaves her her bucket there and goes back to her old town where the people used her and abused her. And she comes back and she says to them, come and see. Here it is. She's boldly sharing, come and see a man who told me everything that I ever did. And a citywide, all the city comes, a citywide Jesus movement breaks out because of one woman who went and shared boldly here. So, and I get it that it makes people feel uncomfortable. Like, I get that. I was uncomfortable when I was talking to Neil, but I get it. But if I could just say like, like this here is like 
our life. You can think like, can you hear me okay? Like, like this is your life. You, this is your life. Okay, so I got to put this down for a second. I'm going to talk loud. So, like, this is your life, okay, friends? And when you think about a bungee cord, they're very useful, right? Bungee cords are useful. I use them all the time. I've got a zillion of them. But a bungee cord doesn't find its usefulness in this natural state, but this state is most comfortable for the bungee cord. It's, and like us, okay, but our greatest usefulness is when we are stretched. When you are stretched out of your comfort zone, you become most useful to God in this context here. But we naturally, we want to just recoil to what is most comfortable for us but I leave you with the visual that your most useful life is when you are stretched beyond what you are comfortable because there, that's what the bungee cord was created for and it finds it, uh, what it is created for comes to its fullest expression when it is stretched. So just rem remember that, remember that friends, when you think about asking five people this year. So Luke chapter 4, verse 14, verse 23 concludes with this. Then the master told his servants, go out to the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. Jesus loves a full house because you have to, you can't share the gospel with the good news. Life can't be trans, lives can't be transformed unless we actually get in front of people. So he wants his house to be full wants people's lives to be transformed. And so as the worship team comes up, I want to close us in prayer. So if you would bow your heads with me. Father, thank you. Thank you that there could even be those here this morning that are hearing in their hearts the words to follow me. And Father, we believe that the wisest thing to do is to put our hope in you, the one that was died and buried and came back to talk about it. And Jesus, for some here that uh, perhaps they're wondering what it would look like to follow Jesus Christ. And so if you're here this morning and perhaps you've never done that, I feel inclined to give the opportunity to receive the opportunity to follow Christ, to cross the line of faith today and perhaps to say yes to forgiveness and yes to be right with God and yes to eternal life and yes to the one that died on a cross and made the substitutionary payment for our sin. And Jesus said this, Jesus said, be not unbelieving, but believe. Jesus said, I want you to believe in me. I want you to follow me. So if that's you today and you want to say yes to forgiveness and yes to Jesus being the leader of your life and saying yes to following him and yes to grace, yes to him taking your sin away. If that's you, you just raise your hand in the back and on the sides, right on. Are there others that want to say yes? Today I want to choose Jesus to be my savior. Are there others? I want to live, I want to live for God. I want to go in a new direction. Are there others? Thank you. Thank you. Use it, pray, use it, you that have raised your hand, if you could pray the simple prayer and meet it in your heart. Jesus Christ, I take you as my Savior. Make me right with you and wash me of my sin. I take you as my Savior. Help me to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. Let's stand. Praise God from above. Blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures.
had a reflection about Neil. Uh, one of the things that I did, I did this three times, because I knew that when I would tell the story, there'd be people to be like, ah, didn't happen. So three times when I spoke in Southern California and I was going to tell the story, I called Neil and said, hey, Neil, could you come? I want to tell your story. And for all the doubters, Neil, I'm gonna, I want to I wanna invite you to stand up from the crowd and come forward. I'm not doing that today. I'm not doing that today. But three times I did that. And I say, for those of you that are wondering, did it really happen? I said, Neil, would you come up and could we, could we welcome you? And Neil would get up and he would walk up and I, and I would say, and this is Neil. But all that to say this, friends, is the power of an invitation. This year, may we leverage that for God in his kingdom. And so next week, Romans chapter 12, we're going to continue there. I want to invite you through that. If you would prepare yourself to receive God's blessing, we want to leave you with his blessing. So if you could put your hands out, and in doing that, putting empty hands before God, you're like acknowledging that I need you to fill them. So Father, as you look at your children, we recognize that you are more magnificent, more majestic than we could ever say. And Father, as you see their lives, may they know that you see them, that you're aware of every aspect of their lives. Father, I pray that you would visit them this week as David prayed, visit me in the night seasons. I pray your hand upon them. I pray that you would strengthen them, that you would bless marriages and bless families. And Father, that you would cause them to know you, to draw near to you this week, to experience your grace and your mercy new every morning. Father, I pray that you would do this and you would do far more, that you would bless them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. God bless you and see you next week. Praise God from I gotta let it out.